Hello, I'm JW. This is a continuation of the series on the Amendment 2 of BS 7671. This time we're going to have a look at Part 6 and also Appendix 6, which is basically the inspection and testing and the model forms that go with that. Not a huge number of changes in this one, but there are a few things there to be aware of. So let's uh, have a look and start with Part 6. So Part 6, uh, inspection and testing. A relatively short part and there's not a huge number of changes here, so just have a look through those. Now, all this not used business is a leftover from the previous blue book. And most of these changes here, where we've got a little mark here, a lot of these are just where they've put BS7671 instead of words that said things like the regulations, this standard, and all kinds of other inconsistent stuff. So that's just mainly tidying up and making it consistent throughout. So chapter 64, this is initial verification, so a new installation. This is done prior to it being energised. And in the section of inspection in 642, we do have an addition here, which is a little mark here. So uh, inspection of the earth electrode or electrodes where applicable. And this is essentially confirming that it obviously exists and it is sized in accordance with the design. So that has now been added in. Of course, TT installations always had these, so wasn't well included, but as we've seen in a previous video, electrodes are now recommended to be installed on TN installations, so TNS or TNCS. And again, where that's been done and part of the design, you do need to make sure that that is actually existing, and it's obviously been installed in accordance with the design. Now a couple of the tests here, the main one being installation resistance. So this here is just the replacement of a single word. It used to say on, and it now says of, so whatever. Uh, insulation resistance though, uh, 64331, it now has the insulation resistance shall be measured between, and it separated these items out into two separate things. So, first of all, between live conductors, and then between live conductors and the protective conductor connected to the earthing arrangement. And during this measurement, line and neutral conductors may be connected together. Now, the kind of implication of this, and bear in mind this is on initial verification, so this is a new installation, not an existing one or ASCR or anything like that. What's this suggesting is that measuring between live conductors, so that would be generally between the line and the neutral on a new installation, you want to do that first, and that's before you've gone and installed things like light fittings and USB socket outlets and all of that stuff. So this is basically just checking the installation resistance of the cables themselves, not the things that are attached to the ends of those cables. So this will be done depending on the installation, but you would do it as a pretty much a first kind of test on those cables once you've installed them. And so if you're going to be putting things like USB socket outlets and uh, such like things which are permanently connected, you want to do this test before you've actually installed those. Because of course once you've installed say a USB socket outlet you can't do this test because of course it would show up as a fault due to the connected equipment. So do that first on the cabling to confirm that the cabling hasn't been damaged. And then, once you've then connected your, say, USB outlets, socket outlets, lights, all the rest of it, then you're going to do part two of this, which is between live conductors and the protective conductor connected to the earthing arrangement. And, of course, if it has connected things like those uh, electronic items or dimmers or anything else, that's when you connect line and neutral together, test between those and the protective conductor. Now, in the previous version of this, it was kind of implied in there, but it's now been separated out, so it's considerably clearer that it is two separate tests rather than just test it and get on with it. The reason for this is if you just install, say, a socket outlet circuit and there are all those USB outlets, if you just put it all in as a new installation and you put all the sockets on and then you come to test this, the problem is you won't be testing the cable between line and neutral. So if there was, say, a damaged section which caused a problem between line and neutral, you wouldn't necessarily know until either it had been energised and that then caused some kind of failure, or maybe months down the line when a failure that wasn't actually detected at the initial stage then becomes and degrades and then causes a fault later on. So test the cables first, collect the stuff, then do the second part of that once you've done that. Now this bit here, 64333, has been uh, somewhat expanded uh, it's where connected equipment is likely to influence the measurement or result of the test. Now this isn't particularly consistent with the table above, but uh, it now says, following connection of the equipment, a test at 250 volts DC should be applied between live conductors and the protective conductor connected to the earthing arrangement, and that should be a value of at least one mega ohm. But of course, if we look in the table above, it's 500 at one and it's 250 at half, so a bit of inconsistency there. This again is only on initial verification, 
and it's where the connected equipment is likely to influence the measurement result out of the test. Now this might be if you've got something that's got say filters or some kind of other connection between the protective conductor and the other parts. Also notable is that manufacturer instructions may require the equipment to be disconnected, as again that may influence the results. The real reason for the 250 is to avoid damaging connected equipment. 250 volts DC should be uh, no problem for any kind of equipment, bearing in mind it's going to have to be working at 230 volts AC, which is a peak voltage considerably above 250 volts DC. In theory 500 volts DC could damage some connected equipment. Not over likely, but certainly is possible. So a bit of inconsistency there, but it's really the idea of not damaging connected equipment, so you could test at 250 volts. But Bearing in mind, if you're putting in a new installation, you already know what's in it and whether it's likely to cause that kind of problem, so it doesn't seem particularly relevant including that, but nevertheless, it is in there. Now we get to RCD testing, and again we're still on initial verification. The effectiveness of automatic disconnect supply by RCD shall be verified using suitable test equipment, just as it was in the past. But now we've got, regardless of RCD type, Effectiveness is deemed to have been verified when RCD disconnects within the time stated below with an alternating current test applied at rated residual operating current. And this would mean, say, for a typical installation, it's going to be a 30 milliamp RCD. So you're going to set the test equipment to AC and set it to 30 milliamps, and then uh, it should disconnect within the time given, so 300 milliseconds for general types and between 130 and 500 for a S or delayed variety. Now we can see the same thing has been added here. This is for TT system, previously was TN, and it's actually repeated in the other sections as well. So essentially what this is saying is that to confirm effectiveness in RCD, all you in theory need to do now is to set the testing deal to AC and then just test out the rated operating current, so 30 milliamps in most cases. If it disconnects well that's all and good. So kind of implying you don't need to do the other tests so at half or times five, or in fact use the other functions so testing types A or F or B or whatever else, depending on the equipment you've got. Now just because it says here you don't have to do those tests does not mean that you still can't do them. You're still quite uh, capable of doing those and test equipment of course still has those functions in it, but for reasons or whatever, just testing it at that apparently is now confirmation that the device does the business. And then finally on the initial verification, we've got an additional uh, piece here on the certification for initial verification, and we've got the person responsible for the new work or person authorised to act on their behalf shall record on the electrical installation certificate or the minor electrical installation work certificate any defects found so far as is reasonably practical in the existing installation. Now this has been reworded quite extensively. Uh, previously it was kind of there, but it was uh, you should record any other defects observed during the course of the works that may give rise to danger. So uh, somewhat different now because it's not resulting in uh, defects that may give rise to danger. It's sort of any defects found. So in other words, if you say go to a property and you want to add or extend an existing circuit, if you've seen uh, other items that don't comply, then you should uh, record those on the certificate you're giving to them, and that would be things that would cover on the existing installation. Now of course the things you're going to be putting in and installing, that doesn't apply to those because obviously what you're putting in and installing does of course need to comply fully, and obviously it would unless you're some kind of charlatan that doesn't bother with these things, but uh, if you go there and find there's something else that doesn't comply for whatever reason, you should be writing it down on the documentation mainly so that the person who's obviously in charge of the installation is aware of these things because the chances are they weren't aware and also to uh, cover yourself as well, because if there was something dangerous there, for example, that you were uh, spotted and didn't report, someone was later injured by it, then of course they might ask, well, why didn't you tell somebody if there were, say, live parts hanging out or whatever? Now, period inspection testing, it's not really any changes here of any major consequence. All the tests are pretty much the same as they were before. You don't need to buy any new test equipment, because all the test equipment you've currently got will be just fine for doing all the things it always did. There's that thing about the RCDs, of course, which uh, in theory you just need to uh, test them on AC only, but uh, whatever, you can still do the other tests and probably should anyway. This particular one here is marked as changed. It's not changed particularly. It now says uh, schedules of circuit details and test results are the appropriate test details in section 643. What's been added is basically circuit details and test results. 
it just said results of the appropriate tests before. So just make a bit clearer there, you need the uh, details of the circuits and the test results for those. But let's face it, most people should have been doing that anyway, because that's obviously the whole point of testing it in the first place. Now that's it for part six, but there's also appendix six, which uh, covers where the model forms for certification reporting are. Now this is informative, meaning it's not actually part of this, it's not something you must do. This is just a suggestion of uh, certificates, things that you could use. And in reality, most people are not going to be using these, they're going to be using some form of software or whatever else, which may well include additional things and probably has done for years. But we'll just have a quick look at what they put on the model forms here. Now for the electrical installation certificate, so the one that should be used for a new installation or a new circuit, most of this is the same here on the front page there, so details of the uh, installation. And if we have a look on the second page, you can see down here we've got this additional part here. So we've got uh, this inspections piece here, and numbered 1 to 14, and it's just a question of a tick if it's compliant or not applicable if not applicable. Now some of this was on another page previously, but it's just been added in here, sort of a summary checklist there, so that's now included. Again, this is just the model form, which is the sort of basic sort of structure of how they presumably should look. But say so most people are going to be using a software or other forms from other places, which may well include stuff like this anyway. But that's now been added in, so it's condition of things like the intake equipment and beta protection has been met and additional protection and so on. Nothing uh, too surprising there, and it is just a question of tick or not applicable as appropriate. Now the minor electrical installation work certificate, this is the one where it says there for minor electrical work, which does not include the provision of a new circuit, so that's alterations or additions to an existing circuit. There's been a few changes here. Top here where it's got details of departures, that was always there previously. But uh, we've now got details of permitted exceptions in accordance with 4133. And where applicable, a suitable risk assessment must be attached. So if you are going to go down that route of risk assessment, that needs to be attached to this. And again, just uh, tick the box there. The others of those are pretty much the same as previous. In the circuit details here, some additional items have been added in. So we've now got the uh, RCD, AFTD and surge protection devices. If present, so you've got the standard they comply with, the type and rating, and the residual current for an RCD there. Now this wasn't included on the model form before, but again a lot of software already includes this and some of that, so not desperately new, but now it's part of the model form. And again here in the part for the test results, uh, most of that existed previously, but we now have AFDDs and SPDs as being confirmed functional. Basically it's got the little window which says uh, either green or red depending if it's broken or not. And for AFDDs of course it's the uh, test button operation. And the same for the uh, RCD, that was actually there already, it's just been rearranged slightly. So just including additional things for additional devices because of course we've already seen that AFDDs are now required on certain circuits. And of course SPDs are required on pretty much all of them. Now the example checklist of items during initial verification. This has been changed around a bit. It's nothing particularly disastrous or huge in here. Some bits have been slightly rearranged and some bits have been expanded. So here, for example, the parallel and alternative source of supply has been expanded quite a bit there. Again, that's all to do with the uh, part eight and the prosumer's electrical installation. So uh, the list is in there and you can actually get these forms from the IET website anyway. So uh, you can actually look at those there or just compare it with whatever software it is that you're using to do these. Now for the Electrical Installation Condition Report, or EICR, most of this is pretty much the same. No uh, real changes there. Still got your list of uh, all the uh, suggested things to check there. And you've also got the uh, inspections things there, which again is again pretty much the same as previous, except for one particular item. Now some of these later on have been slightly rearranged and renumbered, so that's fine. But the most important point here is in the intake equipment, which is visual inspection only, now, as previously, you've got the list of things there, the service cable and all of those items, but uh, we've now got just a single box here, basically for the whole lot, and most importantly is this piece here. Now, a couple of notes have been added here. So note one, where inadequacies in the intake equipment are encountered, which may result in a dangerous or potentially dangerous situation, the person ordering the work and or duty holder must be informed 
it is strongly recommended that the person ordering the work informs the appropriate authority. So if you uh, do an EICR and then say the uh, metering equipment is hanging off the wall or there's live bits hanging out or whatever, then you're supposed to inform the person that this isn't really good and then they are supposed to call up the uh, distribution network operator or the DSO or whatever and get it repaired. And then note two, for this section only, so just this bit, where inadequacies are found, an X should be put against the appropriate item and a comment made in section K. So this is not a code as such, it's just the letter X, which suggests that, say, the uh, service head was leaking and flames were coming out the top of it, so it's going to put an X there and then tell the person, oh, well, you should contact whoever and get it repaired. And then the upshot of this is that if you put an X here, unless it is access to live parts, then the whole thing can be satisfactory. So defective metering equipment or the service cable in dodgy condition, all that other stuff, doesn't necessarily make it a uh, unsatisfactory result. If you've got this X here, and in theory only the person ordering the work is supposed to report this to the relevant persons. Now of course in reality, if you went to an installation and found that the meter was hanging off the wall or the uh, service head had black guns dripping out the bottom and it was blazing hot, what you should be doing, of course, is calling 105 immediately and getting that sorted, particularly if it's in a domestic one where, say, the individual is obviously not going to know what anything about it. And even in commercial industrial, the reality is don't leave it there, just uh, deal with it at the time. But in theory, you can put a letter X and uh, all is well. So there you go. So not a code as such, but it's certainly a new thing you can put there. But I suggest you don't bother because it's just going to cause trouble. Common sense would suggest that if something's defective and needs fixing, call 105 and uh, get it reported and replaced as soon as possible. Now the other main change is on the uh, circuit details. This has now been spread across two pages, mainly because the number of columns has been expanded considerably and simply trying to cram them onto a single page doesn't work anymore. So uh, quite a lot of different columns there. Most of these have been in before and certainly if you've been using uh, software from various places you'll be uh, familiar with a lot of these. But with things like the RCD now we've got the type of RCD as well as the current and so on. So type A, C, A and whatever else, because of course A is now the standard. A, C is no longer applicable. And then the rest of them are now on another page here, as we can see. And we've also got uh, a bit more space to actually write the thing in, should you use this particular format. So a bit better of a layout there. And really just say because of the fact of obviously more columns required and they also need more space to put those. Now for the RCD particularly we've only got the column here for the disconnection time and that is implied that it's going to be the column where you just put in that thing if it's just tested at the operating current, say 30 milliamps or whatever. Now of course if you're going to use other software it may well still have the other columns for the times 5 and whatever else so you can certainly still use those. But these are just model forms so sort of attend as a template. They're not compulsory and you don't have to use these exact ones and in fact I'd say most people probably don't. And although this is not part of uh, part six, uh, this is relevant to it. Appendix three, table three A, as it says there, it's been deleted and it's gone away. What this was, was the time and current performance criteria for RCDs to BSEN 610081 and 610091. And this basically listed the types of RCDs and the, say, residual current and the various trip times for the various types. And this has been deleted, so it's gone away. And the reason being is that other section, of course, states that you only theoretically need to test RCDs at the rated current on AC only. So in theory, you don't need those uh, bits of information that was in Table 3A. However, that information is still in those particular standards and it's not going away. The uh, intent of this is really that that was a uh, thing that manufacturers should be testing and using against rather than at the installation. Whether people agree with that or not is another matter. Personally, I don't agree with removing it and don't agree with only testing on AC at the uh, particular rated current either, but you can do uh, what you think is appropriate. Bearing in mind, this is just a suggestion. You don't have to uh, follow everything in here as if it's some kind of Bible, because it's not. And again, you can do plenty of other things which are not listed in here, and in many cases you probably should, because as we've seen already, lots of other standards are referred to in this. And of course, you probably should be looking in plenty of those in many circumstances anyway. So that is it for part six and also appendix six. And until next time, thanks for watching.